What is up guys? Welcome back to another Geeko Art video. In this one, I'm going to be showing you how to build an awesome $800 budget gaming PC that's perfect for playing all the latest titles. We're talking Warzone 2.0, Apex Legends, Fortnite and more at 1080p while achieving triple digit frame rates. I'll be covering off all the parts that make this build possible, assembling it and also looking at the all important gaming benchmarks a little bit later. Let's do this. The Corsair Xenion 32 inch gaming monitor is a panel that packs a punch, bringing your games and media to life on a vibrant, ultra slim 32 inch IPS 4K display. It's a panel with some power. What's more, the fast 144Hz refresh rate and nippy 1 millisecond response time ensure you can keep a competitive edge. Learn more about the Xenion 32 UHD 144 at the first links in the description below and buy now on the Corsair web store. For the CPU in this build, I've picked up this, the Intel Core i5-12400F. Now, there are a couple of options here for CPUs. You could go for last gen Ryzen, but Intel's 12th gen is an awesome choice and it's cheap right now because the new 13th gen lineups come out and they've got some stock they want to shift. With six cores and 12 threads, all of which are Intel's more powerful performance cores and a boost clock speed of up to 4.4 gigahertz, it is perfect and won't bottleneck even up to like an RTX 3060, 3060 Ti. Of course, with it being a 12th gen processor, it also supports cheaper DDR4 and the more expensive DDR5 memory, saving us some money, and that's where the Corsair Vengeance RGB RS comes in. This is a 16 gigabyte 3600 megahertz kit that fits the build perfectly for this build. A bit of RGB, a nice little heat spreader, and it's easy to install. Something I'll be coming back to in just a moment. Of course though, if we want to actually install the RAM and the CPU, we'll need a motherboard. And for that, I've picked up the MSI MAG B660 Mortar Wi-Fi DDR4. Now, MSI, you've, you've got to work on your naming schemes a little bit, I must say, but this thing is amazing. With support for DDR4 memory, as indicated in the name, and Wi-Fi, it's great for first-time builders, and in terms of its overall layout and design, it's affordable while not being so cheap that it lacks those all-important features you want to see in a motherboard. It's also a really good-looking motherboard and crucially has the LGA 17 1800 socket that's needed to install the 12th gen processor. Installing these CPUs is pretty easy, but you do have to be slightly careful as the sockets are a bit delicate and it can be easy to bend the pins on them. I am unfortunately talking from experience. The black plastic protective cover will then pop off, the arm goes down and that will fasten everything into place. The RAM is next and you might be wondering, James, isn't the four RAM DIMM slots and only two RAM DIMMs? Well, you'd be right and we're just going to use the second and fourth slots. So you always want to use alternate slots and typically it's these ones if you've only got two DIMMs. Beware, of course, this is a DDR4, not a DDR5 motherboard. Those more expensive DDR5 boards won't physically work with the DDR4 memory. One of the last bits to install onto the motherboard now is the storage. I've got a 512 gigabyte Seagate Barracuda 510. It's a Gen 3 NVMe, is available in a range of capacities, and for this build, we'll do the job pretty nicely. As you can see from how battered the box is, this thing's been used a few times before, and it installs just into the top M.2 slot here. I need to remove the screw on the top of the standoff, but leave the standoff in place before adding the drive in and screwing it all down. For this step, you will need a small screwdriver, often referred to here on the channel as a TD tiny screwdriver. Anyway, while I'm here, there is one more thing I'm going to pop in, and this next component might be slightly controversial, as I'll actually be sticking with the included stock cooler with my 12400. It isn't going to give me as much cooling capacity as, say, a dedicated tower air cooler, but with designs like Cooler Master's budget 212 Evo now costing $40 or $50, this thing makes a lot of sense. It's also very easy to install and comes with pre-applied thermal paste. I have used this one before, though, so a drop of fresh thermal paste on the CPU is going to be needed. The advantage as well is that it's going to be really easy for me to install. Just line it all up and then push down the pins. They'll make a nice satisfying click sound, like so. And there's only four that we actually need to do. There's the third one. There's the fourth one. And to just finish things off, add my fan cable into the CPU fan header and tuck the wire away so that it's not going to make my build look ugly because nobody wants an ugly looking build. And in basically record time, the motherboard assembly as it's called is finished. The SSD, 
the motherboard, the CPU, the cooler, the RAM, it's all done. And I can go ahead and move this next into the case I selected for this build. Picking out a good case is never easy. And I know that there'll be a few critics in the comments below going, James, you should have picked the Xylon 4278AB54D Airflow. But I haven't, I've picked this with its nice split plastic design at the front, its mesh at the top and the bottom, a couple of included RGB fans and a really, really cheap price point. That was, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you, the main motivation I wanted to put something together today that was cheap that you guys could go and replicate for your even your first game in PC build right and not have to spend a fortune I'll leave links to updated pricing and availability for this MSI case and all the other components linked down in the description below a bit of a top tip for you as well if this is your first game in PC when it comes to actually installing all the parts in the case it's often a lot easier to do this with the chassis lied down before going all gonko on the motherboard installation you need to check a few things where are the standoffs located. That's these black and gold posts throughout the board. Take a look here and these are all A-OK -okay for a micro ATX form factor, which is what I've gone for with the motherboard. That means that it's a simple case of basically just sliding the motherboard in, lining up the rear I.O. shield, and it will just sit nice and easily on all of those standoffs. I actually think that a micro ATX motherboard in a case like this is great if it's your first build, as it gives more room to actually get the cables run. This is a very, very small case for a full-size ATX design. So three screws at the top on this one, three along the middle, and then a further two down the bottom. While the build is in this state, I'm also going to go ahead and take it upon myself to pop in the graphics card. Now, for a build of this budget, there's quite a lot of choices, and I eventually settled on the RTX 3050 from NVIDIA. If I'm being honest with you, technologies like DLSS 2.0 really swayed it for me in terms of helping to justify this over the AMD competition, but the RX 6600 is a cheaper and still very, very good choice, and the more expensive 6650 XT is a better performing card, but, well, more expensive. I also really like the cooler on this MSI card. It's a gaming X design, not the trio, so it's not going to cost you an absolute arm and a leg. Plus, GPU prices now, aside from the pretty extortionate price tags on next-gen 4080s and 4090s, are kind of cheaper than they've been in a long, long time. This card's got plenty of video memory, an integrated backplate, plenty of CUDA cores, and support, of course, for not only DLSS, but ray tracing too. If you want to game at 1080p, this is one of the best GPUs you can buy right now. And we have, of course, reviewed this in detail over on the website, which I'll pop in the card section. Now for this stage we just need to push back the clip on the PCI slot, slide the graphics card in and the PCI lanes have already been pre-removed for me making things a bit easier. With a bit of pressure you can push it down, it'll make a satisfying click and just need screwing in which will alleviate all of the wobble. Once the GPU's in there's only actually one more component left to go on the installation front and that is of course this, the power supply. A unit so cheap it doesn't actually come with a box. Now you know what you're thinking James, which means it doesn't come with a box. This came bubble wrapped and cable tied nicely together. But to be honest with you, I don't really care because it was really, really affordable. 500 watts is gonna be A-OK -okay for a system like this one. The 3050 only has one eight pin power connector. It's not like all the new 40 series cards which need like 400 watts or 450 watts, nearly as much as the whole power supply. Obviously, if you wanted to upgrade the GPU, I'd recommend a better power supply. And we've got some guides for that, which I'll link down below, recommending the best PSUs for a range of different graphics card choices. Spinning the case around, you'll be able to see I've got ample room for the power supply here. There's two options. It can go either fan down, which will pull in air from underneath the case, or fan up, which will pull in air from inside the case. Not all chassis give you the option of both, so bonus points there to MSI, and that's gonna fit in very nice and easily, like so. Four screws on the rear to fasten it down, and then all I need to do is plug in the CPU to the top left, motherboard power cable to the right, and then the GPU cable to, of course, the graphics card. And once that's all done, the system, in theory, should be ready to turn on and boot. But will it is a question that's probably on all of your minds. So let me grab a monitor, a keyboard and a mouse, try and get into Windows and then run those all important gaming benchmarks. I haven't plugged in the power button yet, so a jump start. Aha, uh -huh. we'll have to do. It looks to me like so far it's booting. One of the fans isn't spinning, which is a bit of a concern. Neither is the one at the back, so that's something that needs to be fixed. Oh, okay, it's booting into Windows. I've got the other front fan on, which means all that's left is the one fan at the back. But by the looks of things, that must be one of the quickest builds I've ever put together. It's all working and it's diving into Windows. But how does it perform in all the latest titles, including, of course, the all-important Warzone 2.0? Well, let's take a dive, shall we, and find out how this thing stacks up. Now that we've 
you've seen just how good this system looks, it's time to take a look at performance. And I'm glad to tell you I got some great results across the titles I tested. In Warzone 2, first of all, at 1080p high with DLSS enabled and set to quality. DLSS, of course, being the key advantage of going for an NVIDIA GPU. And the results of 71 frames per second on average were impressive to say the least. Remember, this is the brand new Warzone game, a full restart for Activision in the Warzone series, and an intensive AAA title by anyone's standards. Move through into Fortnite and the good results carry on coming in. 1080p competitive settings gave 155 FPS on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were also strong too for good measure, with the game looking really fantastic. In Apex Legends at 1080p high settings, this system achieved over 100 frames per second, 106 FPS to be precise on average, with strong 90 and 99th percentile results captured, as always using both NVIDIA FrameView and MSI Afterburners Revertuner. I also tested out Overwatch 2 1080p high settings this time around and here pulled in 192 frames per second on average. Overwatch 2 of course like Warzone 2 is very similar to the game that came before it but a whole restart in terms of coding, system preferences and how the game performs. So to achieve these kind of frame rates was fantastic. Finally to tickle the racing sim temptations inside of me I tested out Formula 1 2022 at 1080p high settings. Once again the results were really solid, just shy of 150 frames per second on average. This is a build that smashes through all the latest titles at 1080p with top tier frame rates and doesn't cost the earth. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in and as always, we'll see you in the next one.